and welcome to another edition of Alexis Wants to Understand a Cool Rock. I'm Alexis, and this is my cool rock. It's called a rose rock, and it came from a box of rocks my husband and I recently collected from his parents' basement. He doesn't know exactly when or where he got it, but there's one thing I can tell you, and it is that this rock came from Oklahoma. How do I know that? Well, partly because it says so on this little paper that came with the rock in a nice little collectible tin, uh, but also because with a couple of very super minor exceptions, Oklahoma is the only place in the world where you find these things. What's special about the geology of Oklahoma, you ask? Well, I spent all weekend trying to figure it out, and it turns out there's kind of a neat little story going on here. So apparently you can find these little guys all over Oklahoma, and the author of one paper I read about this said they, quote, should be regarded as limitless. In fact, they're so common that they're actually the state rock of Oklahoma, which is only unfortunate because they're technically not rocks. Technically, they're minerals, and that's because they have a nice, neat, ordered structure and a distinct chemical composition. Rocks, meanwhile, can be made of multiple kinds of minerals. Alas, Oklahoma does not have a state mineral, and frankly, I am not pedantic enough to be upset that they're called rocks. Still, there's your context, and now, for the fun story bit. Rose rocks form in the Garber Sandstone, which is this huge sandstone formation that stretches through mostly central Oklahoma. It's about 250 million years old, and it showed up during the Permian period, which is the period right before the dinosaurs. If you're like me, and know only the bare minimum about geology, you might assume that there is something special about this sandstone. That like maybe something about how old it is, or what it's made of, or something along those lines would lead to the formation of these rocks. Well, like me, you would also be wrong. See, here's the thing. Permian sandstones, like the Garber sandstone, are not uncommon. I say as if I didn't just learn this two days ago. They're found all over the world, but rose rocks are not. In fact, like I mentioned earlier, with a couple of just super minor exceptions, they are basically just found all over the state of Oklahoma. So, uh, what's going on here? The truth is, I will be upfront about this, nobody knows for sure because geology is complicated, but we do have a few good hypotheses. We know for sure that rose rocks are made of barite crystals or barium sulfate, along with a nice little bit of hematite for that rosy red color. And we know they definitely form in pores in the Garber sandstone. But beyond that, there are two main details for how everything else went down. Idea one, some barium and sulfur ions leached into the sandstone. There, they came into contact with oxygen and a bunch of barite crystals just precipitated out. Idea number two, instead of one stream of water, there were two. One contained barium and the other one contained sulfate, which I am proud to say I remember from my one horrible year of organic chemistry. It's sulfur plus some oxygen. The idea here is also pretty straightforward. When the two streams of water met in the Garber sandstone, boom, you got some barite. Again, seems logical. I don't know which one is right. I was not there, nor am I a geologist. But that's not the whole story here, because that still doesn't explain why rose rocks look like this. Normally, barite crystals are these sort of like tablet-shaped things, kind of like rectangular with some jagged edges. Point is, they don't have the nice like round petally features that make rose rocks look like roses. Uh, so now the big challenge is just to figure out What's special about Oklahoma that allowed this to happen? And the best guess is that the rocks were poisoned. Essentially, that just means there was some compound on the outside of the crystal that stunted its growth and prevented the corners from filling out into, well, corners. And this is where Oklahoma becomes special. Okay, that was... That was probably bad phrasing. Oklahoma seems like a very nice state. I enjoyed it the one time I drove through it, and I'm sure it gets enough flack. Be nice to Oklahoma. So again, no one is exactly sure what happened here, but one hypothesis I read said that the rocks might have been poisoned thanks to oil field brines, which I believe from what I could find are just pockets of like super salty water associated with oil fields. Those brines have a good amount of hydrogen sulfide along with a bunch of barium. So they have all the ingredients that you would need to make rose rocks. But they also contain a bunch of organic carbon containing compounds that according to this hypothesis might have poisoned the barite crystals as they grew. In other words, the compounds might have stuck to the surface of the barite crystal and prevented them from growing out into super sharp pointy angular edges. Neat, yeah? Now, I will admit that this is not the most interesting geology story I've ever come across in my entire life, but I do like it. I like that there's a little bit of a mystery behind it, and also, to be totally honest, rose rocks have some, like, 
really sweet history. Like genuinely sweet, not using that word as a synonym for like awesome. There are just a bunch of cool stories in this paper I was reading, which I'll link to in the description. It's pretty easy to follow if you're kind of used to reading about science. But anyways, there's the story in the paper of a bunch of people who just have sold rose rocks. For instance, there's a story of this guy named Tom Blair, who in the 1990s would go out onto his property in Oklahoma and just like pick these things from the soil like they were a bunch of potatoes. And then he would sell them at a little stand on his property. So you could just like roll up to this guy's house and be like, hello, Mr. Blair, here's my $5. I will take a box of your strange rocks. Side note, uh, the reason he could go out and pluck these things out of the ground like potatoes is because rose rocks tend to be more dense than the rock around them, and they also don't wash away as easily. So as the rocks around them got eroded, rose rocks stayed behind until they ended up in a bunch of soil. I know that a lot of stories have some kind of like human behavior, human interaction component to them, but something I just really like about that story is, I don't know, the dude was just selling weird rocks. He wasn't gonna get rich on them. They have no like functional use. They aren't gonna power your machines or power a national economy. It just, he was just having a good time selling these funny rocks that he found on his land because he happened to live in Oklahoma. So. Will rose rocks ever be, I don't know, as valuable as like gold or silver or other rare rocks and minerals? Probably not, although weirder things have happened, but probably not. But they're still interesting and weird, and I am 100% here for the interesting and weird stories. And I hope you enjoyed this one. Overall though, that's what I've got. If there are any weird little known rocks that you know about that you really like, I would love to hear them. So feel free to leave your stories in the comments. I am new to geology and basically just want to learn all of the things. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate your time and energy and I hope you learned something cool. Oh boy. Huh, Fitbit thinks I, uh, I walked three miles today. The truth is I was just, gesturing with my rocks. <laughs>